Today's reading comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jennifer. Whenever I hear the story of the transfiguration, there's two things that immediately come to mind for me. The first one is this. It is a record that I own, that I've had for most of my life. Um, It's a collection of a few of Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, speeches, and it includes his last public speech, which was the I've been to the mountaintop speech. Um, where he's talking about the transfiguration. It's one of the most powerful sermons on and about the power of transfiguration. It's his last public words. I listen to it every MLK day almost. I didn't this last year because I was very fed by what we were uh, doing here at the church. But um, this record's at my house and I always think of it whenever I think of the transfiguration. And the other thing I always think of is this, which is from Star Wars. I'm not usually the one who quotes Star Wars around here, but this is from Return of the Jedi, and there's like this Ewok party, and they're all partying, and Leia's hair is like really long, and um, because it always matters how her hair looks, right? And um, there's like cool like music going on, mostly drums, and they're like eating food and dancing, and like up on the rooftops, these three Jedi, the long past Jedi, some of them more recent than others, are gathered together, and there's Obi-Wan, and there's Yoda, And there's Vader, Anakin, but healed and whole, redeemed, glowing blue together. And I don't know why, but ever since I was a little girl, whenever I've heard the story of the transfiguration, that picture comes to my mind. I've always saw like Jesus just blue with Moses and Elijah right there with him. It just fits so well. Transfiguration, I think, is something that um, we might not talk enough about in the church. This story of the transfiguration of Jesus' body when he glows, when we see him standing on the mountaintop with his fellow Hebrew Jedi of the past, Elijah and Moses, it's, it's set apart and very different. Some scholars believe this story of the transfiguration to be a prelude to the full resurrection of Jesus Christ like the Easter story. And so right before we get to Lent, we get the transfiguration. And then after Lent, we get the Easter story. It kind of bookends the difficulty of Lent. Jesus is seen in his full glory or close to it. And he's seen with these figures from different time periods or perhaps they are outside of time and yet still right there in that moment on the mountaintop It's just like the Jedi from the different times or like how in MLK's speech, he goes through different time periods. God brings him through different time periods. And he says, you know, but I didn't stop there. And I went on. There's this um, kind of set outside of time motif. Mountaintop moments are kind of set outside of time themselves. They are holy moments. They're holy moments that orient our relationship with God. Mountaintop moments are when we see the fullness of what the kingdom of God can look like. The embodiness, the embodiment, the the, the fullness of this authentic existence, like fully right here in front of our eyes. Not just an idea of it, not just the knowledge of the kingdom of God, right? But an enfleshed 
reality. Peter sees Jesus in his fullness. He hears the voice from the heavens confirm it. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Peter doesn't just know who Jesus is now like in his head and feel the warmth of it in his heart. He sees it with his own eyes, a fully enfleshed witness. It is from the transfiguration stories that we have the term mountaintop moment. These moments are deeply spiritual and mystical. They, they're these moments where we get to see the fullness of God in front of us. We spend our lifetime seeking the fulfillment of the resurrection. The authentic best for us, the authentic best that we could all be, the culmination of generations. And mountaintop moments, they're a brief glimpse of that. If for only a moment, we get to see. We get to see the kingdom of God. It's the brief glimpse. And these moments, they're set apart. They're such a blessing to us. They're like a moment of rest at the way stations of our lives, you know? They're like a golden moment to look back on. We'll have to look back on them because we will inevitably have to walk back down that hill, back into the valleys where things are not perfect, where things are difficult again, where there's hurt and where there's suffering and where things are not perfect. We'll have to go back down into the world and back down into the work that we've been called to do, doing the work for the kingdom of God. And when that work is difficult and we are tired and it has been a really long time since things went well or we have the really hard day, we can look back at those mountaintop moments, those golden moments. They carry us. We hold on to them. Mountaintop moments orient our relationship with God. And they orient us toward the kingdom of God. And they orient us towards the next step in our calling. And they orient us in our flesh. They ground our being. They fill our spirit. We witness to God from these our bodies. Our bodies experience it. We witness the transfiguration of the body of Christ, of Jesus. We witness to this in hope to transfigure the body of Christ, the church, to bring God's full reign into our community in flesh between us. I love the story of the transfiguration, mostly because of the response we get from, pre from Peter. I, I love Peter so much. He's like, Rabbi, it's so good for us to be here. Let's make three dwellings, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say for they were terrified. Peter saw Jesus in his fullness and was terrified, overcome with everything he was witnessing. And yet his suggestion is great and so on point. Let's just build tents up here one for you and one for the other two Jedi masters, right? And we can all just live here forever. Like in this holy moment with everything aglow, with no problems, just witnessing to God, can we please just stay up here forever? Please, please. It's so good for us to be here. I don't want to go. Let's just stay. A common response to mountaintop moments is this urge to hold on to them to stay in the mystical moment where things feel perfect, but that's not an option. They're fleeting. I love Peter. Of course it was Peter who said something. Earlier in Mark's gospel, it's Peter who walks on water. When Jesus, uh, he sees Jesus doing it, and, and historically, like, disciples are supposed to be able to do what their rabbis do. That's how it's always worked. Okay, if a rabbi could do something, the disciple that follows that rabbi can also do that thing. 
So when Peter sees Jesus walking on water, he's like, tell me to come to you. I know I can do this too. And he actually does for a few steps. Like he makes it a couple steps before he goes into the water. What beautiful bravery and audacity we see in Peter. And then in chapter 8 of of Mark, right before the transfiguration story, Jesus is asking his disciples, who do the people say that I am? And who do you say I am? And the disciples were like, some people say Elijah and the prophet, like a prophet. And Peter is the one who looks at Jesus. He's the only one. And he says, you are the Messiah. Peter sees who Jesus is. And Peter wants to do what Jesus can do. And it's later, after Jesus' death and resurrection in the book of Acts, that Peter challenges the other leaders of the way, the other disciples, the apostles, after having another mystical experience where he's told by God that it will not just be Jews who will be part of this community, but also Gentiles, and they will be baptized as well. And and when he explains to the other disciples that this is what he saw, he said, this is what God said, and who am I to hinder God? To open this community in a way that they never thought was going to be possible. Peter is excited, excited to witness to the new thing that God is doing all of the time. Peter's always looking for the new thing that God is doing and to see if he can do it too. He's always looking for his next step in following this rabbi. He doesn't expect an end to his growth. It's not like I found God, so we're all done. I made it this far, I'm very comfortable. Let's just stay right here. Yeah, and I think, I think Peter witnessing to the transfiguration fed into that for him, I do. To have an experience that reveals that what we are right now is not what we are in the end. That who we are right now is not who we will be tomorrow or in the distant future. And that if we're lucky enough to witness to the glory of the coming of the Lord, that that is to inspire us as we work toward it. It's supposed to inspire us toward the next thing, not create stagnancy. Not like I've seen God, so now I've arrived and it's all done. (laughs) It's to be inspiration towards the next step. But what does it matter, right? All of this, all of this talk of the transfiguration, what does it matter? It, It leads, I think, to two larger theological conversations around the question of what does the transfiguration mean for us? Like, right now, here we are as the church, 2021. What does the transfiguration mean for us? And we've kind of touched on it, but I'm just going to bring up two things and go a little deeper with those. The first is I think we have to name how these holy moments, mountaintop moments, are meant to inspire us but they are not spaces where we are meant to stay. We can't build tents and remain. Not unless you're trying to be a monk. And there are monastic orders of almost every religion who do leave society and go to experience this. It's very rare. I imagine most people, the majority of people who are worshiping this morning don't have that particular calling. So for the rest of us who are not expecting a life of living in a monastic order, we can't build tents and remain. We have to go back down the mountain and do the hard work. Which means that things are not going to be comfortable or easy. Because being a disciple is really difficult. I mean, just look at Peter, the amount of growth I, when I was writing this, I was thinking about people who I've heard who they talk about their church experience and when they come to church, they're like, oh, it always feels so good. Everything's very hunky-dory for them. Everything feels so good. They always just feel warm and welcome and everything is perfect all of the time. And I just don't know what that's like. It's just not an experience for me. 
Like, it's never been like that for me. I'm not even critiquing that. I'm just going to say that there's a lot of us for when we decided to become part of a church community, it was a lot of being stretched and a lot of growth, like every day, like every single day, still getting challenged and still growing, learning how to judge people less and love other people more and being very surprised by the people that I now love. Um, Looking back and seeing how I've been stretched and how I've grown and who I've welcomed into my heart and into my life. And only because God has done that transformation on me. There's a lot of us for whom being in a church is difficult and painful, but it's also very rewarding I mean, I think good works like that anyway, right? Difficult and and there's a lot of growth, but it's rewarding. If we're not learning to love our neighbor more or out looking for that new thing that God is doing, knowing that we will be a bit concerned, perhaps even terrified by it, then what's the point? I want that Peter kind of discipleship. I want to grow. I want to get better. I want to follow Jesus every day and to be made new and to grow and change and to experience sanctification. Amen. To experience sanctification. The holy moments, the mountaintop moments, remind us of what we're working toward, not where we are all the time. It's not supposed to always be a glow. Witnessing to the full glory of the coming of the Lord. That's not where we're building the house. We're not setting up tents. The next larger theological conversation around the transfiguration and what it can mean for us, I think has to do with the actual body of Jesus that was a glow the actual body of Christ, and also the body of Christ, the gathered community, the church. What does it mean for Jesus to have been transfigured, and what does it mean for us as the body of Christ to be transfigured? Now, for those of you who know me, that's a very Pastor Winter kind of question. That's a very bumping into um, (laughs) particular types of postmodern theology. But I think it's an important question, I do. Susan DeWitt Hall in her book um, reminds us, she starts just by defining the word transfigure. And this is basically what comes up if you do a Google search. It means to transform into something more beautiful or elevated. And she goes on to say, when Jesus was transfigured, he was revealed as more fully himself. More of the truth about him was displayed than had been previously seen. Of course, Jesus is truth. And the truth has to shine, just as his face did that day. What does that look like for us here at Manchester UMC as the body of Christ, transformed into something more beautiful or elevated? To shine with the truth of Jesus and have his truth more on display, to have the authentic essence of who God is here and of who we are on display. And I'm going to get into a little bit of evangelism here. I'm going to do some evangelism here. Because if we're talking about the body of Christ and being more authentic, we have to ask the question, are there parts of the body that are not here yet? Are there parts that we're not paying attention to? Are there parts that maybe we're paying too much attention to of the body, on the body, parts that we prefer and want to attract more of, or maybe we do attract more of. Who do we struggle welcoming? Do we prefer families? Or are single people made to feel welcome? Do we like all families or only particular looking families? Do we want two parents here every time? Do we really love children or do we only really love the children who are very quiet? and who are in peak health. Do we really want the queer community here? Do we want lesbians, gay people, bi people, trans people? 
the trans figure? Can the trans figure come to Transfiguration Sunday at Manchester UMC and feel welcome? Can they feel welcome and wanted? What about people with physical disabilities? What about when their bodies were once healthy and they begin to not have that health? Have we found spaces and ways to make sure they can make it into worship with us to be part of ministries? To still feel plugged in as things change for them? What about all of us who struggle with mental health issues? Can we imagine the transfigured body of Christ, a body that has mental health issues? Can we see that? What does it look like for that body to be authentic and aglow and honest about those mental health issues? Are we okay, really, with people that look different than us, you know? Biracial people, indigenous people, people of color, younger people, older people. Where are your biases? I know mine. What about the addicts? Do addicts have a space here where they can be honest about the fact that that's what they've been through? What does it look like for them to be named and claimed as part of the body with that body transfigured? More beautiful, more honest, elevated, authentic. Can we have addicts here without us looking down on them? What about the unhoused? Is there like as long as they, what, clean up before they come in the building? Can they be part of the body? What about the non-tithing? Are we cool with them being here too? Those who don't yet know how to or cannot yet live into their financial discipleship? So I'm just assuming as I say this list that you are all saying yes. I can't see all of you. I've only got like a really small portion of our beloved community in this space, but I'm assuming you're all saying yes. And I think you're all saying yes, not because every category I just listed was easy for you or for me. That was not the point. No, no, I, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, but I still have a lot of work to do. I've been to that mountaintop. We've seen it. We've had those holy moments. And we go back down to the valley. And like Peter, I want to be a part of the new thing that God is doing. I want to seek our next step in following this rabbi Jesus. I expect growth and a bunch of discomfort. A bunch of discomfort. And it gives me great joy knowing that I'm not in this alone and that I have you. That we have each other. Because I know that no matter how difficult the work is and what the days look like, I know that I will again see, I expect to see the glory of the Lord And when we do that work together, I see it more and more. I see it in you. So church, what does our community, transfigured, look like? Authentic? Brave? Beautiful? I wish comfortable was on that list so badly, but it's not. Comfortable is not on that list the mountaintop moments where we can be authentically ourselves are supposed to inspire us to go back down into the valleys where people feel hidden, where they are hiding who they are, where they are filled with shame, and where they hurt, where they think they are unlovable and that no one will ever welcome them. And we are called to encourage them and to inspire them to also be transfigured into their authentic selves, to be welcomed into this body of Christ, to welcome them into a church community, to create the world as God wants it together, to take on the difficult challenges of being community, of loving neighbor and of loving and worshiping God. There is not time to build tents. Not with all of those people who need a home, who 
who need a church home, who maybe need our church home. Amen.